This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome this morning to worship here at Woods Church. It's great having you all here and those that are watching online. We appreciate your participation in the service. Inside your bulletin are some announcements. Uh, first off, Pastor Nancy is around the corner. She's helping lead a new member class for people to learn more about membership here at Woods. If you'd like to learn more about Woods, there's no shame. You can get right up and go to Founders right now and then come back for the 11 o'clock service. But it's our chance to share more about our church with people that have been visiting. As it says in the bulletin, we are uh, very grateful for Sarah Wilson, who's coming on the staff to help us with adult education and small group work, as well as to be a, a pastoral support. She's completed a seminary degree and has been working as a chaplain over the last month, so we're excited to welcome Sarah. Also today, we have both the middle school class and the high school class. Uh, we're beginning again the Sunday morning classes for them. Now, we probably didn't time it the best since all the youth are here, but just know that each week going forward, we have those offerings during the 9.30. Our hope then is to start up the youth group again, which meets Sundays at 5.30. We're going to start that on February the 19th and meet twice a month for that. Other announcements, uh, this Saturday there's a coffee house featuring the praise band, so come join a, a simple time of fellowship and good music at 7.30 on the 11th. On the 12th, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and so our confirmation youth are going to help us once more to receive your donations on Super Bowl Sunday. They can be canned goods. It doesn't have to be soup. They'll go to the food pantry. We'll also be taking and receiving monetary donations. And... Uh, We'll probably have two sets of pots. If you have a particular team preference, you can put your money in the appropriate uh, pot. There are also information in the bulletins about upcoming the youth uh, tubing trip for middle school and the ski trip for high schoolers. And then the Woods Work sign up is also online. Winter Relief is coming. We'll be doing this in March, the 13th through the 20th. So be thinking ahead how you can help and support this important outreach to the housing insecure in our neighborhoods. And then if you're also open to helping address immediate needs when people have concerns around rent or utilities, um, Dick Moore's been our main advocate for the Cecilia McKay Fund. These are our funds that we provide for folks that come to Woods or call Woods saying they have an immediate crisis. And if you can help with that ministry, uh, Dick would love to tell you more about it. Lastly, as we move through our interim period, we will be beginning a time of a mission study. This is a congregation-wide survey. Session approved this yesterday, and you'll be getting a letter and some information in the coming days. But in about two weeks, we'll be sending you a link so that you can all take an online survey to talk about the church, what, is, uh, what excites you about the church and its future, so we can get your opinions. We'll also have some paper versions available for people to do by hand. At some point, I'd say during the first hymn, when the uh, less punctual Presbyterians arrive, sometime then, <laughs> sign in on the green fellowship pad so we know that you're here and take note of who's next to you. But let's take a moment to greet one another with a sign of God's peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.
of our callings. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Please join me in the call to worship. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. In this way, we give glory to our God in heaven. Through our worship and praise, may Christ, the true light, be reflected among us so that we may walk in joy and the righteousness all our days. Truly may the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forever. Let us worship God together. that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Trusting in this good news, let us come before God in prayer, confessing our sins against God and our neighbor. Let us pray. Merciful God, too often we stumble around in darkness of our own making we tend to look inside ourselves for answers to the challenges and difficult questions that surround us instead of looking up to you for guiding light and direction. Forgive us, we pray, for losing our faith-filled perspective and placing our trust in what we think we know. Remind us that you are constantly preparing and lighting the way for us and that if we seek you, you will find us.
friends, hear the good news. Christ has redeemed us, called us by name, and offered us the gift of redemption. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. forward the children for their time this morning with Miss Cat. So please come join us up here on the floor. Today is my son, John Sawyer's birthday, and he turns 30, and I can't believe he caught up with me. <laughs> That's amazing how that amazing. happens. I know, because I was 27 when I had him. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, I have a light. Can you see it? Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it bright and shiny? Okay, well, she's talking about my smile. No, it, it's in here. Do you know what this is? This is a bushel basket. I found out today that if you put a lid on it, it becomes a crab basket. I was this year's old before I knew that. Um, but I used to t take these, and my grandfather was blind. But he was a, fa he was, he was a farmer, and so we had a one-acre garden. And he knew where the hills were for the potatoes because they go like this, see? And so he would take a hoe and he would rake up the potatoes and we go behind him and pick them up. I know that sounds weird, but we did that all the time. We loved it. Mostly because he let us ride in the wagon back and forth. That was really fun. Anyway, so this is a bushel basket. And our story that Pastor Randy's going to preach on today is about don't hide your light under a bushel basket. Why not? Thanks. It won't shine, you're right. And if, and if the light doesn't shine, a li light means God's protection. And if the light's not shining, then there's no protection from God. That would seem to make sense, wouldn't it? Fortunately, God is not held by a bushel basket. <laughs> God will still protect us. But... Um, what if, what if it were a candle and I put it in the bushel basket? What would happen? <laughs> if you go camping, try it. It's lots of fun. But um, yeah, so instead, God says, or Jesus says, to put your light on a hill. And this is where you guys, you Marylanders, are way ahead of us. Because I now have a crab basket. And I can put my light up on that. And it will shine. Like a big hill. That's right. And so here's the thing we learned at Jamie's and Jesus today. And um, that the light under the basket is held really close. But then when you do things to show God's love, it goes out like this. So can you guys show me? Don't hit each other. You're shining. Face or hands. Ready? I'll, I'll look. Ready? One. Two, three. Grown-ups, I want you to get out of your bushel basket. We're going to try it again. All right. Look to the children. They'll show you how to do it. Ready? One, two, three. Yes. Yes. And another way to shine is by singing. We have some friends who are going to sing with us today. And if you accidentally hit somebody, another way you can do it is you can either do this or that. Yeah, yeah. This works too. We can just 
be all over the place. All right, so we have some friends who are going to sing. So instead of closing a prayer, we are going to go sit. You see that big expanse of carpet right there in front of the purple um, coat? We're going to move there unless you're singing, which is going to stay right here. And I believe that Mr. Dave is going to come help us with that, right? Okay, so we're going to sit over here. You ready? Are you singing? Okay. Are you singing?
Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of my attending Chesapeake Bay Middle School. As we prepare for our first scripture reading, please join me in the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Holy God, by the power of your spirit, reveal your will to us today through your word as it is read and proclaimed. Help us to understand your work of redemption and send us into the world to teach in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts 17, verses 22 to 28. Listen to God's word for us today. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. What therefore your worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the place where they would live. So they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Hi, I'm Lucy Davis. I am in eighth grade at Sperna Park Middle School. And for our second sc scripture reading, this morning it comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Listen, listen for God's word for us today. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a city built on a hill that cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and gives light all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This ends our scripture, reading of the scriptures. Thanks be to God. Beethoven wrote a total of 32 piano sonatas when he died in the age of 57, some of the last ones he wrote were the Opus 109, 110, and 111. I'm going to play the opening to the last movement, the third movement of the Opus 109. The, op the movement itself is a series of theme and variations. And so this opening is simply two eight-measure phrases. It's a simple melody. I'll repeat each phrase once. 
but listen to, again, the beauty of Beethoven's music from one of his late sonatas. So the first two scripture passages we heard, one talked about Paul's visit to the church in Athens, the other is Jesus' famous words about being a light and salt. I'm gonna companion that with a passage from Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter two, the first 12 verses. So listen to God's word for us today. Paul writes this. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come to you proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you then in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Now, yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. So now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of God's word. Ludwig von Beethoven lived from 1770 to 1827. Now, earlier we sang the hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, which is based on the famous uh, third movement from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. 
And um, just now, you heard me play a bit from one of Beethoven's late piano sonatas, the Opus 109. In the early 20th century, one of the foremost interpreters of Beethoven's music was a teacher named Arthur Schnabel. On several occasions, Schnabel literally performed all 32 of Beethoven's piano sonatas. And once he was asked, now why do you have this devotion to Beethoven? And Schnabel replied, I'm attracted only to music, which I consider to be better than it can be performed. And there's a lot of truth in these words. I've been playing the piano since I was seven years old, and yet there is still much for me to learn. I constantly am finding new beauty in pieces that I literally learned decades ago. Bach, Beethoven, Rachmaninoff, their music is literally better than it can be performed. Something is there in that music which exceeds our abilities. Because we can learn the notes, and we can listen to performances, we can take that music inside us. And even though there's still so much to learn from it, our lives are enriched immeasurably because of our encounter with the music. Now, I know that there are many of you who are probably shuddering to remember the hours you sat on a piano bench trying to practice your scales or hit all the right notes in Fur Elise. Practicing for hours as I know, does not guarantee that great music will emerge later. In the same way, following a recipe down to every detail does not guarantee the souffle won't fall or the turkey comes out dry. Carefully planting flower seeds does not always mean that every single plant will blossom. But through it all, we still practice. We still try new recipes. We still plant our gardens. Because life isn't cut and dried. Life isn't transactional. It is aspirational, full of hope. And what is true of life is also true of faith. Transactional versus aspirational. Now, frankly, much of our life is spent making transactions. You work a set number of hours and your employer then promises to pay you for those hours. You buy a car or a house. You sign a bunch of papers promising to pay back that loan in a specific number of years. Our daily lives are shaped by transactions, but we are not defined by our transactions. There's something deeper, richer, more life-affirming that actually gives meaning to our days. That's why you practice the piano not to memorize notes, but to make music. On a wedding day, you stand next to a person and you say your vows not to finalize a legal contract, but to now begin building a life together. We, all of us, aspire to something more. We believe in something that gives our lives meaning and joy and peace. And that aspiration, that ability to dream, is a God-given gift. It's a spark of the divine. It's part of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It literally makes us more than just human beings. It makes us aspiring people of faith. Now, long ago, the Apostle Paul didn't want to go to Greece at all. He was a Jew who had spent his life living separately from non-Jews, from Gentiles like the Greek communities. But a heavenly vision compelled him to leave the eastern shore of the Mediterranean and to cross over the Aegean Sea to the cities of Greece, to visit then Philippi, the book of Philippians, Thessalonica, the book of Thessalonians, and Athens. In each of these cities, Paul walked around and familiarized himself, and he saw mostly marketplaces, markets crowded with stalls, where merchants sold goods and haggled over prices and transacted business because that's what shaped their transactional lives. And as we heard in the reading from uh, Acts that Lucille did, Paul noticed that in these marketplaces, there were lots of altars to foreign gods idols that could be worshipped, 
where food and flowers and coins could be literally left at their feet in order to transact a favor from that idol or given to their priests in order to win the favor of these foreign gods. So at some point, Paul climbs up over the crowd. He stands on a wall and he begins to preach. And by his own choice, he chooses not to preach about a transactional God, but an aspirational God. One that he says is unknown to them, but is truly the God who made the heavens and the earth, who doesn't live in a shrine, but who gives hope to all that's been revealed in the good news of Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. So in that sermon, what Paul is doing is planting a seed of aspirational hope in their hearts that then in time and by God's grace would bloom into a new and an abiding faith. And then we're told that Paul left Athens and then went to the city of Corinth. And once more in Corinth, Paul saw their markets He saw the idols. He saw their fascination with exotic wisdom and foreign philosophies. But he refused to play by those rules. So what we heard in 1 Corinthians 2 is Paul saying, quote, I didn't come to you proclaiming the mystery of God using lofty words of wisdom. Paul wasn't trying to be like everyone else. He wasn't selling religious goods at a bargain price. He said instead, no, I decided to know nothing among you except one story of Jesus Christ and him crucified. In effect, Paul would teach them a new song. He would tell them about this Jewish rabbi and miracle worker who lived and then was crucified but was raised again from the dead. And the good news about Jesus Christ then would literally change their lives, their whole orientation And it can do the same for us as well. To paraphrase Arthur Schnabel, Paul was committed to sharing a gospel that was infinitely better, deeper, and richer than could ever be performed or preached or even shared. It's so much more than just the words on the page. And that's why Paul would say in the next passage, It is something that no eye has truly seen, no ear has fully heard, no heart of human making fully conceived. And yet it consists of something that God has prepared for all those who love the Lord. What Paul is doing is inviting us to shake off our dependence on a transactional way of life that too often just leads to competition and distrust and racism and prejudice and fear and instead calls us to aspire to something that's bigger than that, something more holy, planted within us, God's own spirit, far more than we can imagine. So the question is, what does this aspirational faith actually look like? Well, to better understand it, I'm going to talk a bit about philosophy and truth and a bit about piano music. Long ago, Pontius Pilate interrogated Jesus Christ. And as they stood there in front of the crowds, Pilate mockingly asked him, what is truth? If we were asked the same question, we might say, well, truth involves those things in life that are accurate, that are correct. A water molecule contains two two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Or two plus two equals four. All of those are true, correct statements. But their correctness is static. It's unchanging. It's simply facts that we can memorize. It's not something that emerges us from our souls. For that, we have to think of a different type of truth. It's also possible to think about truth as something that is revealed. A scientist discovers a new truth. A detective uncovers what the truth was to the matter. To uncover or to discover something is basically to unconceal it, to reveal what was always there, but what had been hidden away. This type of truth 
is not a thing. It's not a single fact. It's a process. It's a movement from lesser knowledge to greater knowledge of finally seeing things more fully. It's what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 13 when he said, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. The Christian faith is not simply something that you learn. It's a truth that you've always sensed inside. It's a relationship with a loving creator that on some deep level you've always been aware of by God's grace. And through the movement of the Holy Spirit, that awareness gets uncovered and brought to light. And in that movement, in that process, it becomes then life-affirming and sustains us for the journey ahead. And so that's why Paul tells the church in Corinth about a son of God, this story that he uncovers for them about the one who was crucified, though innocent, who was resurrected, though dead in the tomb. And in that moment, a deeper faith is awakened, and we can aspire to do better, to live as followers of that truth, from this day onward. And perhaps in a small way, that's part of why I played the Beethoven Sonata for you today. As I said, that sonata is one of the last three that Beethoven wrote, but the reality was by the time Beethoven was in his 40s, he was already totally deaf. Now the deafness was likely a condition caused by lead poisoning as lead was very commonly used in glassware and wine bottles in the 1800s, 18th century. Beethoven then never physically heard some of his greatest works. He never heard the Ode to Joy to his Ninth Symphony. He never heard his Missa Solemnus. He never heard his last series of string quartets. And he never heard the Opus 109 Sonata. But you can. And you have. Something written 200 years ago, unheard of by its own creator, has been given to you, that you can discover it and be blessed and inspired by its beauty for the journey ahead. Christian faith is not the assemblage of correct facts. Christian faith is the nurturing of a deep and a loving wisdom that's been planted in the human soul ages ago, designed to blossom forth in our lives and the lives of our children. It's a melody that's been entrusted to us, something that perhaps been, been heard more fully by all of you than it was heard by people a hundred years ago. And it's our joy and our obligation to share that melody and that truth with others. 100 years ago, Albert Einstein jotted down a piece of paper theories that only now are being proven. 200 years ago, Beethoven wrote a sonata he never himself would hear, but it's been given to you. And 2,000 years ago, God acted in Christ to reveal a love and wisdom that still brings hope and life all the millennia later to us. So remember what Paul wrote. He didn't want our faith to somehow rest on human wisdom. He wanted to be sustained by God's power, a power that's existed since before the ages began. And he insists that the truth of this faith is something that no eye has fully seen, no ear has totally heard, no heart has imagined, but it's something that God has prepared for us as those whom God loves and to whom we love in return. So discover this truth and the goodness of God's plan and go forth now aspiring to sing its melody and to ever walk in its light. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Caring for and supporting children and youth are central to our mission here at Woods. Starting the adventure in reading and parenting for a different world are two organizations that share that mission here in Anne Arundel County. To give, text Woods to 73256, visit woodschurch.org and click on give, or drop your offering in the plast plates. Will you please pray with me? Gracious and generous Lord, humbly we bring to you a portion of what you have given to us. Your blessings are limitless love, and we pray for that same generous spirit. Empower us to give freely to others in ways that would best serve them. Help us to give without judgment or fear, trusting in your wisdom for all of us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
to heaven now. You must take it to take it away. come together in a time of prayer, we remember those with special needs, praying especially for Jean Lafferty, who's recovering from some health concerns, for Jeff Norris, for Dennis Rohrbach, and others. Please join me in this time of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, through the testimony of those who know your love, we have been guided to gather in this place to come together as a people of prayer, to ask for what we need. Our Lord Jesus called his disciples to live as a city on a hill, as a light on a stand. May we do so that all may see the glory of you, our God. We pray for the church, for the community of disciples here and around the world. Grant that all people of faith may shine as light in our dark world. We remember how the Apostle Paul led the church not by lofty words of wisdom, but by pointing to a deeper truth born of your spirit and entrusted to us. May we aspire to be the people of that faith, sharing that good news. Blessed are those who honor your commandments, O Lord. We pray for our world and for the governments and its leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion. May they serve the common good that the people may flourish. You remind us to offer food to the hungry to satisfy the needs of the afflicted. We pray this day for the sick and the hungry, the poor and the homeless, for all who are oppressed and afraid. We remember especially Jean Lafferty and for Dan and Pete and Carol and Harold, for Jeff Norris and Robin Williams, for Dennis and Mary, for Louise and Carla, for Charlie Phelps, for Wayne and Carolyn, for Pat, for Marion and Stu, for Edie and Jeff, for Reynold, for John, for Marianne and Peggy and Charlene. We ask your grace to be with Kathleen Hamlet with the recent death in her family. Be with our mission partners around the world for those that care for others in this community and in global places of need. Loving God, let your church and let us as the church Minister to those in distress and bear witness to your abiding compassion for any who suffer. For to you, O God, be all glory and honor through Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Hear us as we offer the prayer taught to us by Christ as we pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and give us sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
God's truth is more than just a series of facts. It is literally a seed planted within you. Trust that that knowledge intends for you to bloom, for your light to shine, for your aspirations to come true. And be not afraid. May the grace of God, the love of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and give you peace this day and forevermore. May all God's people say, Amen. Amen.